today's episode, we are going to fix a DAT player. Hey, welcome back. Today, we are going to fix a DAT player. Uh, if you don't know, this is a DAT tape and this is a cassette tape. They're a little bit different, but they're also the same in some ways. Uh, the tape itself uh, is about the same width on each one of these. Uh, so there's not a lot of difference, at least appearance wise in the tape itself, but in how it operates, it's very different. Um, obviously you can see this is uh, a lot smaller of a container. It's also, um, protected, completely protected. Uh, this The tape doesn't get exposed unless it's actually in the player, whereas, you know, a cassette tape, you can actually touch the tape itself if you want to. Uh, don't do that, but you could. Um, so this is a little, a lot more secure, a um, lot more compact, and overall better quality. That's the whole, the whole purpose this was invented was to get a lossless digital audio format so the old cassette tape was introduced around 1967 uh, the dat tape was introduced around 1987 so what is dat good for well uh, originally it was meant to replace the old cassette tape format but due to high costs and high price of the uh, decks and, and things like that. It just never really caught on in the consumer market. I did read that uh, there were some actual studio albums released in the DAT format. I'd never seen one, uh, but apparently there was small offerings made towards the beginning, but that quickly fizzled out as I think everyone realized it just wasn't catching on for that use. Uh, so what is the use case for a DAT? Well, primarily it's for, since it makes lossless digital recordings, it's, it's good for recording things. What would you record then? Well, original recordings, if you're an artist and you want to lay down tracks for an album or what have you, you could use DAT to do that. Uh, the other thing that was kind of an unintended uh, use case for it, I think, was recording bootleg concerts. And that be ended up becoming a big use for the DAT. So if you wanted to have a full one-to-one -one copy of what you heard at the show, then try to smuggle in a portable uh, DAT recorder and uh, go to town. And actually, uh, the person who I got this DAT player from, and by the way, it's a it's an Iowa XD S260. Uh, he was a big deadhead, as you can see from the uh, sticker that's on this particular unit. Uh, what do deadheads like to do? Well, they love recordings of the Grateful Dead, um, it, live recordings, and there's tons and tons of recordings out there and collectible, um, a lot of a lot of deadheads like to collect all the different recordings from all the different shows and there's a massive archives out there of that sort of thing because i think the dead in particular was one of those bands that they were they're kind of a jam band so every concert was a little bit different it never quite sounded the same from show to show because there's a lot of improvisation and and different things going on at each show so having a recordings of those shows is very important for that fan base um, and in order to really appreciate a band like the Grateful Dead you have to hear those live recordings um, so the guy who gave me this uh, DAT player, he, he told me that that's exactly what he used this DAT player for was to play back bootleg uh, concert recordings of Grateful Dead shows. And he told me uh, one of his friends, I guess, was one of the guys making these recordings. And what he would do was he had a special hat rigged up uh, that had microphones built into it. And the guy would smuggle in um, his portable DAT recorder and, and kind of incognito stand near the soundboard and uh, his hat microphones would, would pick up the recordings and no one would be the wiser. So uh, I guess he had a lot of, of these bootleg recordings. I guess they're now all on the internet somewhere. 
um, but uh, that's that's what he used this DAT player for was to play back those recordings. So it's a little bit of history. He also said that uh, he bought this from a friend who uh, brought it over from Japan. I think he said he paid around six hundred sixty dollars, some somewhere around there for it. Um, you know, I guess it's a lot cheaper to buy these in Japan because that's where they were made and you didn't have to pay the import duties and taxes and all that kind of stuff if you brought it over yourself. Uh, so he paid one of his friends to get it for him in Japan and that's where this particular unit came from. Uh, by the way, based on a magazine, an audio magazine article that I found from 1992, this unit originally retailed for $1,100. So getting it for uh, 600 bucks is a pretty good deal uh, for when it was new. So to be honest, I've never owned a DAT player before, so I wasn't quite sure what to expect with this. I, I knew it was broken when I got it, um, and I had an idea that I could probably poke around and figure out what was wrong and see if I could get it working again. Uh, so that was my intention here. So first thing I did was open it up uh, and you know power it on, see what was going on with it. First thing you can see uh, that's going wrong with it is it's not opening up so hard to play a tape if you can't get a tape in there so first is to kind of inspect the uh, mechanism that loads the tape and I, I did find after doing some searching online there was a service manual available uh, it wasn't super helpful uh, as far as figuring out what's going on with this but I did kind of deduce that there really is only one belt in in this machine and and belt is always the first thing i look for especially when it comes to eject issues because almost always those motors are belt driven so first thing i'm going to look for is a belt and sometimes there's more than one luckily in this particular unit there only seems to be one belt so that will hopefully make things easier so poking around looking around you can see in the back here there is a belt and when you press the eject button you can see there's a lot of slack on this belt so this belt has clearly gone bad over the years which is no surprise it's been several decades of of this belt being in use so it's it's uh, about time for it to go bad so this one clearly has uh, got too much slack on it and it's not doing its job anymore so we'll have to replace that uh, the trick here now is to figure out how do you get a new belt back on and if you look at the mechanism there are several gears stacked on top of each other so not going to be able to get a belt around that um little cog or what would you whatever you call it uh, without taking it apart so if we look at it this top gear is gonna have to come off and that will allow us to kind of lift up the other gears that are underneath it just to give us enough of a gap to sneak that uh, new belt in there and uh, unfortunately uh, that screw holding on that gear is does not want to come off so that ended up becoming more of a problem than I anticipated uh, I tried a number of different screwdrivers and different screw um, heads and, and things of different sizes and none of them could uh, budge this thing and it got to the point where the actual uh, Phillips head uh, uh, shape in the screw head was starting to deform because I was torquing on it so much um, so I didn't want to strip out the whole screw head itself so that that wouldn't have been good so i tried other things i tried uh pliers i tried you know all kinds of stuff and just nothing was breaking this thing loose and then i realized i should uh consult the age old engineering diagram and see does it move yes or no no should it move yes okay wd-40 time 
So I, I was a bit hesitant to do this because I didn't want WD-40 getting on the lin, or not, there's no lens on this, the, on the uh, tape head or, um, you know, on any of the other electronics in there. So I was very careful just to get a tiny drop in there. I let it sit for a few minutes and uh, work its way in there. And then I came back and voila, just like nothing, that screw came right out. So I probably should have uh, tried the WD-40 a lot sooner. So lesson learned there. Uh, give that a shot if you can't get stuff loose. But again, be careful about getting it all over the place inside of a sensitive electronics. Um, so once that gear was off, I was able to, after some trial and error, to get a, a belt in there. It took me a little bit. I, I went to my bag o belts uh which is just you can buy for a couple of bucks off off the internet and get a whole ass assortment of all sorts of different uh not particularly well made uh belts but they're good enough for this all i need is enough torque or enough uh tension to get these uh gears turning so that the um uh, the tray will uh, go in and out and that's all all this really needs to do so it doesn't need to be a, a precision belt of any type so these these belts are just good enough so I kind of tried a few of them until I got one that was uh, gonna be tight enough on there and and finagled that one in there after a little bit of, of work it would have been nice to have three hands to do something like this but uh, I got it on there So once I got that there, then um, magically the eject mechanism worked again. So problem number one fixed. Problem number two arose when I put a tape in there. Um, part of the uh, problem here was uh on the user myself was i wasn't quite familiar with how to use a dat player so i kind of had to learn on the fly of like how do i record things and how does the uh tracking work and you know it'll keep track of tracks like a cd player and it'll automatically fast forward and rewind to the tracks that you want which is pretty cool but you kind of have to know what you're doing when you're recording to make sure that that sequences correctly so once I figured that out, I got some recordings done, and then I discovered that there it wasn't wasn't handling it quite well. So um, there was some audio dropouts, the rewinding and fast forwarding. I don't know. There seemed to be problems going on, uh, and I wasn't quite sure what what this was about and if 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 I could fix it or not. So did a bit of research. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I did learn a lot about how the inner workings of the, uh, of the DAT player worked. One of the things I found interesting was the head mechanism itself was a lot different than I was expecting. It's a lot different from a cassette tape, whereas a cassette tape doesn't move. You know, it, it runs the tape over the head and then it can read it backwards and forwards. That's why there's side one and side two on a cassette tape. DAT player is not so much. DAT player is a lot more like a VCR in the way that it, it operates and records tape. It only, um, it records, it's called helical scan. I think I'm pronouncing that right. 
Uh, and basically it's just like a VCR, the head spins on top and it records onto the tape in a sort of diagonal slices. Um, and then uh, the tape wraps around and moves around the head as the head spins, just like a VCR. So I thought that was a little interesting. And it's also why the DAT tape only runs one direction. There's no side A or side B. It's just goes one way. You got to rewind it, play it again, like a, like a VCR cassette. So thought that was interesting. Um, and then as I dug into this, I also discovered that, um, there are some pins that are on the uh, deck itself inside that that connect to the cassette tape. And I, I guess these sensor, they're kind of pogo pins. And I guess these pogo pins um, help determine where the tape is and what's going on with the tape and relays that information back to the player uh so the player knows what's going on with the tape and where the tape position is and all that and apparently what happens over time is these pins get dirty or corroded and start sending erroneous information or um or things like that things get disconnected from the connection between the tape and the tape player and that's why there are dropouts and it has problem finding what track it's on and and comes up with errors and things like that so my first uh thing i was going to try for this particular problem was the easiest thing to try before i ripped the whole thing out and tried to really dig into it i could see that this particular player these pins these pogo pins were easily accessible and so that was nice because i've seen other players in my research that those pins were inaccessible unless you took the whole tape mechanism out and looked underneath it and did all this stuff, which I was hoping I was going to have to do. So luckily that part was easily accessible. I was able to spray some deoxit in there and then work those pins up and down with my finger and uh, leave it for a little bit and let the deoxit do its work and then dry it off with uh, with a paper towel just to make sure that there wasn't any residual moisture in there before I tried to power this back on. Uh, another thing I looked at, which apparently is another thing that goes wrong with these, is the clutch mechanism that uh, slows and stops the reels. Uh, sometimes there's a felt pad on there uh, that does the braking. And apparently the felt pad tends to come apart or come loose or fall off over time because it's just glued on there. Um, and if that happens, then the mechanism has problems slowing the tape down or stopping the tape in the correct spot. So that will cause problems. So I did look into that while I was in there. Luckily, this tape mechanism makes it easy to see and get at that part where some other loading mechanisms don't allow that quite as much but i was able to see that uh clutch mechanism and luckily in this case that piece of felt is totally intact so there's no need to uh, mess with that luckily so hopefully um the only thing that needs to be done is cleaning these pogo pins so got it back together did another test of the audio and made some uh, some new recordings and uh, to try to see if if I had uh, remedied the problem and playing back these these new recordings no dropouts I'm able to fast forward and rewind and change tracks easily uh, I've been using this thing um, for a few days now and just been listening to it a bunch and making recordings and playing back those recordings and so far so good so it looks like we've solved this one uh so there's two problems the the ejector and then cleaning the uh pins so all that really took was a new belt and some deoxit and we're back in business what am i gonna do with this dat player now that it works I have no idea, but it's cool to have. I like it. And, you know, maybe I'll just make myself some mixtapes or something with it. Uh, so there we go. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Hope you learned something. Retro toilet. Turn your retro crap into retro gold. See you next time. Uh, you know what? This one's dumb. Dump it. Trash it. This one's garbage.